and was helping other people with different things and stuff going on at home. So I'm not going to do a formal history presentation. I'm going to talk about man, my dad, James P. Neary. But first, before I do that, you're seeing a replica of the Susie Q. Mozart. That was made by a very wonderful man, Dave Posky, from Mass, who rebuilt a different marauder. And about a year ago, I think, he approached me about getting permission to put Susie Q on the other side of the fuselage of his plane, because he does share it with the public. And of course I gave him permission, and we got involved with other things. I helped him with the report. He has a, there's a magazine that you're going to be able to see in, in our um, refreshment room. Um, but he has an article in about the rebuilding of the plane. He asked me to do a byline about my dad's experiences with the torpedo and such. And then he started making these. For one for me, one for Josh, two for the Marauders. And this one is for sale. And um, he's just been very wonderfully gracious for the whole group. So now I start with my dad. Anyway, Jim Urey was born in Cartersville, Montana in 1918. He was a farm boy, second of nine children. Dad was a Norwegian immigrant. Um, his mother was a product of a Swede and a German. And um, wonderful background, full of color, stories. Um, his role in our family later was that of the storyteller of the raconteur. The kids would gather around. Always lots of stories to tell. He had an exciting childhood, full of, you know, depression time, but full of fun and vigor and accidents and crazy stuff. So that was, that was how he got started. And then he went to high school in, not in Cartersville, which is a very small town, but in Miles City, in uh, Custer, Custer County High School. And um, they had to do that because their local high school is very small. So he would go into Miles City and live with his grandma Johnson and live up there. And um, they would stay there, help her, go to school, tease her, go to school. My dad was very involved in sports. He was a good student. While he was at high school, he made a best friend named Hank Schwartz. I mentioned him because he was very dear to my dad, and they were going to try to connect in Australia. In their training, they signed up together in 36, shortly after they graduated from high school. Hank had had some flying lessons back in Montana. Dad used to go watch him take those. He couldn't afford them. But um, they signed up together, and then they were sent to Chinook for the early training, and um, spent about a year, I believe, in, in Chinook, doing all things mechanical to learn about taking care of airplanes, that kind of thing, and then were sent out to different areas to help work on airplanes. My dad got sent to March, and his friend Hank was further north of California. So they communicated a lot, they got together a lot, Hank, came down to Riverside, which is where my dad was, and, and um, Marshfield was there, and where they met my mom on a blind date. And uh, that's the woman that my dad calls. Her name is Alice, but he called her Susie. And that's why he made his plane, Susie Q. But um, they went their different directions because of the kind of training they had. It used to be pre-war. You had to have two years of college before you could become a pilot cadet. And this was pre-war. So they were working on planes while they were going to school, getting their two years in, and their schooling ended just about the right time because they got into pilot kid at school. There's some time to finish before the war started and went through different ways. Now, Hank, I think I have this right. Who's our, who's our expert? Oh, he's gone from the room. Mm -hmm. um, your expert, your, your curate. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to him about this and I said, which plane would it have been? Hank ended up flying, he was shipped earlier to the Philippines and then across, and he was in the very first action in that area. I believe it was an A-24 from talking to your curator. It was a two-man dive bomber. Yeah, it was the Navy's SBD that the Army used, and it was the A-24 version. 
Okay. So it was basically an SB Dauntless. Okay. But the Army used it, so it was an A24. Oh, it's called an A24. Okay, so he was correct, then, uh, which I didn't doubt. <laughs> but anyway, so Hank was involved in the first day when he was in action. He was last seen diving on Lake, small island. And um, was reported missing in action. Um, Dad had heard that. Of course, that was very harmful, but Dad had also heard stories about people going down in Australia, being lost in the jungle or, or helped by the natives, that kind of thing, and eventually being rescued. And he determined that when he got to Australia, which was the intention, that um, he would go looking for him and find him, and he would be and bring them home didn't happen. And I'm really happy that Dad didn't know when he went into the Midway battle that Hank was already gone. It would have been so much harder for him. Because what kept him alive and, and determined to return to the island with his crew was one, keeping the crew alive, two, getting back to his new bride. Because early on, when they were at Langley, they had all their training Dad had started out in a B-25, uh, most of the time, not all the time, in a B-25. Is my voice coming out there okay? It's good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and um, when, when they did the first war games, um, now I'm in, in Texas, he has uh, stories to tell about the rainwater in the bottom of the tent and how uncomfortable it was and everything like that. And wanting so bad to get back to Langley when they were done. There's, there's side one. Wanted to get back to Lang Langley in time and everything. And um, then he ended up having to stay behind, waiting for another B-25 to get repaired. So he got delayed. And then, returning home, he was introduced to B-26. And uh, that'll, that he'll tell you about in his program we have here. Um, he loved it. He really loved it. Um, most of the pilots that had good skills loved it, and those they needed more training, they tried to give it to They had to figure out the plan, I might have to tell you that, um, because it was so different. And it, it was figured out, loved. They really enjoyed flying that plane. So, um, I'm gonna have to follow my notes so I don't get up. Okay, good. Cadets and Langley. Turn the page. Sorry for my pun, yes. We're sticking together. Okay, when, when they had a, a second war game, they were in Savannah, and um, my dad had been sick. He had had fever and what but they realized it was appendicitis. And so he got on antibiotics and was getting treated for the appendicitis. He was able to take part in part of the Savannah games, but because of his congestion and such, they were worried about his ears, so he didn't get to do too much, and then they were called back early to base for obvious reasons. Things had heated up and they thought things were going to start happening. And then they were being deployed very shortly. I mean, here they are, just back. And, and all of a sudden, December 7th happens. Everyone is told to return to base immediately. And they were off by the, by the 8th. They were taken on their way to New York. And that was not a very pleasant place to be deployed at that time. It was a big mud, mud lot. Essentially, they didn't have enough accommodations for them. I mean, their, their supplies got sent on the train. They weren't even deployed properly on the train, so they didn't have all the things to put the tents up, etc., etc. It was not a very comfortable place to be. But from there, the, the 22nd was doing recon. Some off, off the coast, some further south in the, in the, in the, in the Gulf, that kind of thing. And um, Dad was one of the lucky few they got sent to Tucson to work out of Tucson instead of out of New York area. And he was happy to be there. So, and they learned that they were going to get Christmas off, the ones that were there in Tucson. They were going to get a couple of days off at Christmas. So he and his best friend at that time, um, Jojo Dewan, whose book we referenced here, um, sent for their girlfriends. Now, Jojo's fiance had come from Maryland to stay at my mom's in Riverside. So the girls said, oh, sure, we're going to jump on the train and join our guys. Well, they got married, Christmas Day of 41. And um, that was the beginning of a long train. 
friendship. I mean, it was really great. So I've, I've been involved with their children, the Ruan's children, and it's, it's been a fun time. Now, they were, okay, they were there at Muir and Tucson and whatnot. And I found just recently the actual number of days that my dad was, was hurt. Um, in January, he was in the hospital at March Air Force Base for 20 days because his appendix burst. And I'm familiar with that situation. But, um, so my mom went to the, the field, uh, the, the hospital there, March, to visit him. And she was very unhappy and surprised to find him on a gurney in the hallway outside the morgue. Mm. They didn't expect him to survive. Mm. And when we're, when we're done here, and we're later in the hospitality room, if you're interested, I do have some pictures to share. I didn't have the time to make a presentation. But um, one of them that is very touching for me is when, after they had arrived in Hickam, one of Dad's fellow members, Mr. Burroughs, Ray Burroughs, was helping him walk. It shows my dad looking like a stick. And this was after leaving Riverside on the train to get up to San Francisco, to get on the ship to go across to Hickam. Well, he was so weak when he left with Riverside that his fellows, his guys, had to carry his bags for him. And then they went across on the ship, got to Hickam, and that's where the interesting things started happening. And I was going to make a comment. I spoke with our gentleman here, our Hawaiian, about, because I wasn't sure how much would be true about it, but I read and been told that the military there had an agreement with the local mechanics to do the work on their airplanes. And when these B-26s arrived, the military wasn't going to let our B-26 mechanics put those planes together. They had to be done by locals, who had no idea about anything B-26-ish. So, our guys had to come back in and redo a lot of stuff that was done on the plane. My dad's first plane was 1398. It was the one assigned him. And unfortunately, some colonel took it up. And it was put together quickly. It was still February when it was put together. Some colonel took it up to fly and ended up crashing it into the mud bank or something. And it was very destroyed. He, he then got assigned to 1391. And um, that's the famous one. I mention that number again because when he's going to be talking on one of these shows that you're going to see, um, he says something about 1392. That was a misstatement. It shows you that the number of the plane was as important to him as it was to other people. But anyway, um, so you know he was he was sick, but he got stronger. He had a little bit of time because they didn't deploy to Midway until you know later. Um, it was like the end of May, yeah, very late May. And that's when they had been approached by the Navy, done very basic training. I mean, he tells a story about after these torpedoes were attached, this had to be on Fort Island initially for training, um, where one of the generals, I think he said, present, said, okay, the torpedo looks like it's as far off the ground when it's sitting on the ground, right? And he said, okay, I want to see how this works. Um, who's going to take me up? And so my dad raised his hands out, not knowing if when they bounced off, it wasn't even a regular hill. You know, it, was, it was one of those um, uh, mats, I think they call them. So he wanted to see, can we do it safely on this mat? Not explode when we land. So those were all fun days. He didn't really get that much training. And then they deployed. And I think Jim Collins knew a little bit more about what was going to be going on. He was a little older, maybe better informed about what they were going to find in any way. And Dad went into it not knowing what to expect. I think the other pilots all knew nothing. So it happened the way it happened. And Dad tells the story best, and I'm going to have that showing pretty soon. But I wanted to mention Take them and be honest, what I say here. Um, after Midway, my dad, he'd been weakened, he was hurting. 
PTSD is an understatement. He saw or heard, he didn't see, he didn't see, um, you know, Mays go down, but Mays was one of his best friends at Pickham, and he was flying one of the other planes. Mays is the one that went across the Akagi later. It disconnected their communication wires, and I think he was already dead, dead in the seat at the time, because the Japanese talk about seeing a bloody face on the pilot, and went into the water. And so, of course, he wasn't recovered. And I have some really horrible, touching letters from May's wife to my, my mother and my father saying, you know, what do you know? Have they found him? Are they searching for him? It took her a while to accept the fact that he wasn't coming back because she was pregnant with his child, who looked exactly like him. You know, it's, it's just the war. Anyway, um, my dad, wasn't able to eat or sleep for 10 days. He ended up, he wasn't on a radio broadcast. Ron, I, I thought you were gonna mention that. You didn't mention, you didn't show the radio broadcast picture. That's in the next one. Oh, okay. I won't talk too much about it then. I, I, no, I got you. Okay, um, there was a radio broadcast, several crew members were, and several of my mom's friends in Riverside had listened to it and heard it and said, how come you, those were your husband's you know, crews and that kind of thing. And she never got to hear anything because she was working at the bank at the time. Um, but all this was secondhand information coming back to her, his bride, you know. And his own sister, going to nursing school to join the army, was in Montana, went to the movie with friends and saw her brother on the movie screen in the newsreel. She hadn't seen him in three years, and he's here with black hair and black mustache, and she's, that's my brother. <laughs> Big surprises, because the Midway News started creeping into the States. And I don't know the rationale behind why things were done, but Dad did it 10 days, uh, about a few days of R&R &R there in Hawaii. And then in August, he was sent back to California on a special mission where he had a briefcase, locked briefcase attached to his wrist. He had to keep it on at all hours and wear a sidearm. And um, he picked up my mom and his car and drove to Montana to see his family and then on to Washington to deliver that, that, that very important information, whatever it was. He thought he was gonna be sent to Australia. My mom thought she was gonna be put on the train to be sent back to Riverside. And a few days passed, and a few days passed, but Hap Arnold had different ideas. Hap Arnold sent my dad to Eglin Field with the mission to make the torpedoes work better on the B-26s. And that assignment lasted the better part of two years. And it just, it wasn't meant to be. Improvements were invented, don't get me wrong. And there were even a few successes that were almost accidental, but the RAF landed two torpedoes on ships, I think, in the Mediterranean, if I'm correct. Um, and I think one of the Aleutian early ones accidentally accidentally dropped a torpedo like a bomb onto a, a boat and had a success that way. They just were not going to work. Torpedoes can fly low. I mean, marauders can fly low and fast, but they can't fly slow enough to deliver a torpedo. It's just, you have to design a whole new weapon to do that. So it wasn't meant to be. But after Eglin, he was sent to, he became a major while there, and um, my brother was born there, two, two days, two years to the day after they were married. Um, it was sent to Watertown, South Dakota, and he was committed to the base there, which was a cold weather training facility. Um, and he commanded the base there for a while. And while he was in South Dakota is when he was commissioned out as his first service, as a reserve pilot and he had put in for a real commission, and that took a little while to get, I mean, a few months to be notified of. And he went to work for International Harvest there in, in South Dakota. And um, as soon as he got his notice, he said, well, I'm going, so he went to Great Falls and signed up again, and he, he got his commission. And from there, it was all over the place for him. He worked in, uh, he was then almost immediately to Japan. Yeah, he was in Japan from, Let's see, we didn't join until 48. It might have still been 47 when he was sent over. He had to go over six months earlier than we were, were able to be there. And um, it was still pretty chaotic at the time. And 
And uh, so he did two years, two and a half years he did in Japan. After that, um, the Korean War was going on and he worked in, out of um, McCord Air Force Base. Uh, in Nats, he was the person in, in, uh, in control of um, the sending supplies to all of our troops that were in Korea. He did that. He had a pretty good commendation for doing that for a while. And then several other stations um, in the States. And um, then we were sent to Brussels, Belgium, where he worked at the MAG for three years. Um, an attaché uh, advisor, and um, that was really fun for us kids, I can tell you that. It was a nice, calm country, and I had a lot of freedom. I was 9, nine to 12 years old over there. I could do almost anything. And we had a big, beautiful, uh, old mansion with our international schoolhouse, so we had a lot of fun there. But um, coming back from, from Belgium, uh, he had had to he had been grounded while we were there, but that hurt. He, his eyes and ears were going, and he had been grounded had high blood pressure, that kind of thing. And um, so when we came back to the States, he got assigned to it. A naval air station near Grand Prairie, Texas. Wasn't his choice. Um, he did have a job to do, he got it done, and then it, things got slow, and there wasn't much to do. And he said, well, I either find something new, they're gonna find something new, or I'm gonna retire. And that's what he did, he retired at 59. And so, that's kind of, man, he was a simple guy. He liked doing things everywhere he went. They had, in, in the military in several different places, they had sports going on. You know, when he was at Anglin Field, even in Chinook, they had teams. And he was Mr. Basketball, Mr. Baseball, and so he helped with these teams. He had fun. He had, a, he had a good life when he was in the military. But he didn't really get a lot of attention after the war. He didn't want it, he wasn't looking for it. And then people started looking for him. And later in this year, my mom passed in 2001, and um, in his later years, he liked the attention it gave him something to do. People, people around him in Montana found out that he was there. Long, I don't know, Andrew, you know, the long news, newspaper article in there, I'm sure. Um, Lonnie Bell was his famous country western person. He was on a PBY in, Montana, in Hawaii at the time all this was going on. He was doing recon and such. Um, didn't even know that my dad lived anywhere near him. He was, had a radio show in Billings. And um, then, ironically, my parents' house cleaner, after my mom had passed, she was there helping dad. And she saw the famous painting on the wall. And uh, Ray, Ray Grinnell shot across the bow. You can buy shirts, by the way, with a depiction of that. Anyway, um, she asked him about that. She said, what, what is that? Because she had heard of the movie, of course. And, and um, he said, well, that's my airplane. She said, your airplane? You're the one with that? And so she went home and told her dad, who was connected to Lonnie Bell. Her dad was also a singer and that kind of thing. And I mean, it just grew from there. And they had like a little lunch group that used to get together and share and all that. And he had a lot of good time in his last years. And so people would come from sometimes out of state looking for him just to talk to him, send him things. Would you like to grab this and send it back? Oh, he had his good time, even though after all that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> anyway.